film industry has made great movies about money. Some of them are gambling movies like Ocean's Eleven, The Sting, and Casino. Some of them are stock market movies like Wall Street, Boiler Room, The Big Short, and my personal favorite, Trading Places, which is essentially a movie about oranges. More, more on that later. The film industry has also produced one of the great movie franchises in history. Of course, I'm talking about the James Bond movie franchise. And I'm guessing when you think about James Bond, you think of the actors who've played the character, but you might also think of the themes and the plot lines of these movies. And I wonder if you have thought of world domination and terrorism and trying to start a war between or among superpowers. I wonder if you've thought about how does James Bond's opponents ever obtain the capital? Do you remember in that great movie, You Only Live Twice? Blofeld carved out a volcano and shot a spaceship to outer space? Boy, that sounds like that costs a lot of money. So most James Bond movies don't tell us about capital and the raising of capital. Now, one of the great things about the Bond movies is there's always a nemesis. They have cool names like Goldfinger and Blofeld. There's an evil organization called Spectre, but we never really know how does Spectre obtain its capital. But then we were introduced to Daniel Craig as the James Bond character in the 2006 Casino Royale movie, and we learn a lot about the financing of the James Bond adversary. So here's the movie poster for Casino Royale, and over there on the right side is James Bond's opponent in this movie. His name is Le Chief. And like many Bond villains, he has an interesting physical characteristic. Notice on his left eye, he has blood coming out. He has a blocked tear duct, and he cries tears of blood. How cool is that? Now let me tell you just a little quick uh, summary of this Casino Royale movie. Le Chief receives $100 million from some freedom fighters and promises to provide them with legitimate banking services. But before I get into the details of Casino Royale and how Le Chief could have made some money had it not been for James Bond, let me welcome you to the NASDAQ Trading Lab here in the Willman Business Center, which houses the Graham School of Business on the campus of York College of Pennsylvania. My name is James Forgen. I'm an associate professor of finance. I've been teaching here for over two decades. I have a PhD in finance from the University of North Texas, and I also hold the CFA designation, the Chartered Financial Analyst designation. More on that in just a few minutes. But here inside of this trading lab, we have 32 desks. We have 32 desktop computers that are hidden underneath. So students come into class and they get the computers out or they bring their laptops. And then we start having our lectures, we start having our visits, and we talk about everything related to finance. Now the first course that students will take is one that we call Managerial Finance One. And this is really a capital budgeting course. Let me go ahead and pretend that I'm a professor and give you a lecture on capital budgeting. Capital budgeting is simply the process of planning for the investment in long-term assets that generate product lines and services. Let me start by giving you an example with some local flavor. About 75 or 80 years ago, there was a guy who lived in York, Pennsylvania. His name was Kessler and he created this new kind of a candy bar. And he put some chocolate in it, and he put some, some sugar in it, and some peppermint, and probably some eggs and milk, and it was a circular candy bar, and he called it a York Peppermint Patty. People would come from all over the place to buy York Peppermint Patties. But here's the thing about capital budgeting. This is what you'll learn in this particular class. Capital budgeting implies that an entrepreneur has an idea like a candy bar. And this entrepreneur then presents this idea to the public, presents this product line to the public. And as a consuming public, we either like it or we don't. Capital budgeting tells us about the process that businesses go through so that they can present a product line so that we like it, 
And when I say we like it, I mean that we're going to buy it. And we're not only going to buy it today, but we're going to buy it next week and next year. Now, one of the cool things about capital budgeting, of course, is that it involves risk. So risk management principles are extremely important in capital budgeting. The second course that we will require finance students to take is one that we call investments. Notice I have two pictures here. Here's a, here's a picture of the NASDAQ exchange up in Manhattan, and then a picture of the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange where Trading Places was filmed. So Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd were on this location and they benefited when the price of orange juice fell. Now, one of the cool things that I do in the investments class is that I require students to create what's known as an investment policy statement. The assignment is for students to create a fictional client and then craft a policy statement designed to satisfy the risk and return objectives of that particular client. Our investments class is patterned from the CFA Institute's program. Now you can go to the CFA Institute's webpage and you'll find the York College logo on there. We are affiliated with the CFA Institute and let me read this to you. The affi an affiliated university signals to their students and to employers that their curriculum is closely tied to the practice of investment management and is helpful to students preparing for the CFA program exams. In fact, we have multiple students over the years who take the level one CFA exam, sometimes even before they graduate. My point of all this is to make certain that you're aware that inside of this classroom, we have all of these computers here. And remember that these computers are loaded with the Morningstar software, so you have access to all mutual fund data. We also have 12 of these that uh, are Bloomberg terminals, so you have access to pricing and supply chain stuff. It's really, really amazing amount of resources that we have inside of this lab. Now let's swing back, let's swing back to uh, Lachif and Casino Royale and James Bond. Most people are aware that investors want to buy low and sell high. This is called taking the long position. But many investors are aware that they can do that in the reverse order. This is called taking a short position. So there's a position in which investors can benefit when prices fall. I'm wondering if some of you have been following the GameStop example in early 2021 as a great idea of shorting and all the problems that uh, are involved with shorting a share of stock. Now let me swing back to capital budgeting. Remember that guy Kessler and he had, this, he had this candy bar. The success of this candy bar depended on the candy bar's ability to generate lots and lots of cash flows, not only today, but next year, next two years, next decade, let's say. Well, inside of this James Bond movie, there is a company called Skyfleet. And Skyfleet is an airliner. And what they're planning on doing is they're planning on introducing this spectacular airplane. They're going to unveil it to the public. So when the public sees this, much like when we bid into a York peppermint patty, the public is going to look at this airliner and say, boy, the next time I fly, I want to fly on that airplane. What this means then is that investors will bid up the price of the shares of stock, bid up the price of the bonds. Now we don't know anything about Skyfleet stock price. So let me go ahead and just assume that it's $100. Now remember I said that investors can benefit when prices fall. One way to do this is use a derivative security that's known as a put option. And a put option gives the owner the right, but not the obligation to sell a financial security like a share of stock. And that right but not the obligation comes at a fixed price. This is called the exercise price. So let's suppose that Lachif buys $100 million worth of the right but not the obligation to sell shares of Skyfleet stock for $95 a share. Now in the movie, it's a great scene. Lachif calls his broker and says, hey, I want to buy these put options. I want to short these shares of stock. And the broker says on the telephone, he says, dude, you're nuts. Nobody expects this stock to go anywhere but up. 
And Lashif says, just do it. So as audi in the audience, we're scratching our head and we're saying, what does Lashif know? What's he going to do? Well, he plans on hijacking a gasoline tanker and crashing it in to this spectacular airplane and then blowing the airplane up. So you think about this. If Lashif is successful, what will happen to Skyfleet's stock price? Clearly it will fall. Maybe it will fall substantially. Maybe it will fall to zero. Maybe it will bankrupt the company. Now, of course, what happens is that James Bond uncovers this plot. He follows this bad guy throughout the airport. They hop on this uh, gasoline tanker. There's a big fight and James Bond ends up winning. He pulls the tanker aside right beside the airplane and he saves the day. He ends up killing the guy as well. So the plane doesn't blow up. Skyfleet stock price does not fall. The next scene is Lashif talking to his broker and this investment banker says, your puts have expired. I'm not sure how much money you've lost. And Lashif says $101,602,000. So Lashif lost it all because the stock price did not fall. Now, of course, that's not the end of the movie. What happens is that Lashif arranges for a poker game that Bond gets to play in and Bond wins $150 million. So let's try to figure out exactly what Lashif was trying to do. Now, those of you who know something about option pricing, you might be interested to know that I got out my Black Scholes Merton option pricing model and I made some assumptions about inputs and I came up with a reasonable price of $4 per option. Now, remember, Lashif had $100 million. So if each of those options cost $4, he bought 25 million options. Now, it doesn't quite work like that, but let's not worry about the exact mechanics of option trading. So we have two, two outcomes, two potential outcomes, right? Let's suppose that Bond is not successful. Let's suppose that this terrorist at the airport kills Bond and then blows up the airplane. What's going to happen to the price of Skyfleet stock? Well, it's going to fall. And I made an assumption. Let's suppose it falls to $50. So think about what that means for Lashif. He has the right, but not the obligation to sell at 95 when the price is now only $50. This option has tremendous value. It has $45 in value. So Lashif is going to make 25 million times that $45. He's going to make $1.125 billion, which translates into an over tenfold return, 1,025% return. So think about what Lashif wanted to do purely from a financial standpoint, not a moral or an ethical standpoint. He was going to use somebody else's $100 million, make a billion dollars, then return that $100 million to those freedom fighters, and he'd have $900 million all for himself. Now, of course, if Bond is successful and the price stays the same, then Lashif will allow those options to expire and they'll expire worthless. <laughs> and so what happens? 25 million times zero dollars worth of a value of an option that gives him zero dollars. So what happens? We have a scenario under which Lashif can either gain over a thousand percent or lose 100%, lose it all. This is called leverage. Leverage is a tool that investors use to magnify their returns. This is super exciting. I think life here at York College is pretty exciting, perhaps not as exciting as the life of a secret agent, but I can promise you that as Graham School of Business professors, we will do our best to prepare you, marketing, management, statistics, supply chain, accounting, we'll prepare you in all of those areas so that you can pursue the career path that you desire. I'd be delighted to stay around and answer your questions.